Hi there, it's Ben from World Have Your Say. This is a download from the BBC. If you want to read our terms of use, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts. Here's today's programme. This is Lise Doucette from BBC News. You're listening to World Have Your Say. Hello, I'm Krupa Bhatti. Thanks for joining us. Some German newspapers are calling it another Obamagate. It's certainly not been a good week for the U.S. National Security Agency. Claims of large-scale trawling of phone call information in France and Spain, as well as eavesdropping on German Chancellor Angela Merkel, have dominated this week's headlines. The EU delegation in Washington have described the row as a breakdown in trust, and it's the sheer scale of these operations that have got you gripped. So we're bringing you back to basics on spying. Why is it done? How's it done? And who does it? Our spying experts are here to take your questions. Tweet us using the hashtag WHYS. So the very latest on this story is that two top uh, American uh, spy masters, the director of national intelligence and the director of the NSA, are preparing to testify before Congress at a hearing scheduled to begin at around 1.30 Eastern time. We, We will, of course, bring you the very latest when we can on the BBC World Service. So do keep those questions coming in throughout the next hour. We'll get as many as we can to our guests who who have joined us. And I'm going to let those experts introduce themselves, starting in Washington. Hi, this is Jim Bamford. I'm a writer. I write on NSA. My last book was The Shadow Factory, a report on NSA from 9-11 to the eavesdropping on America. Hi, my name is Annie Mashon. I'm a former British intelligence officer with MI5, the UK Domestic Security Service. I was involved in a whistleblowing case in the late 1990s around cry, uh, spy criminality. Hello, my name is Christian Black. I was a professional soldier for many years. I also work for the Defence Intelligence Staff and the Joint Intelligence Committee. I now write uh, spy-based thrillers. Hello, my name is Claude Monique. I spent 20 years working with the French external intelligence uh, as an agent and uh, an undercover agent on the file, on the field, and uh, I'm now running a private intelligence company in Brussels. Thank you to all of you for giving us some of your time. Now, let's get straight to those questions that have been coming to us all day via Twitter, Facebook and by email. The first is Bob in Australia. He's posted on Facebook and says, how do you reconcile the stated justification of spying for security reasons <clears throat> with a style of monitoring, which is at best a fishing expedition and at worst industrial espionage? Maybe, Annie, you want to start first and then the rest of you, please feel free to pick up. Well, that's a very good question because in the past... Uh, the idea was that you targeted specific threats and you put your resources to look at those threats and aggressively investigate them. And the idea that evolved in the late 20th century under democratic systems was that that should be proportionate and that that should be overseen and accountable to the democratic government of the day. Now, what we're seeing at the moment is a breakdown not only of the um, rather feeble oversight structures, both in the US and the UK, but because of the advance in technology, we're now seeing the capability for spying has become this huge Magnet, indeed, not just a fishing expedition, but a trawling expedition, which has um, involved, it meant that we all end up and all our privacy could everything can now be hoovered up and stored electronically. So I think there are two key questions. One is the sheer scale of the technical capability um, and how we manage our, our spying through that. And then secondly, how we bring our surveillance and oversight laws up to date to ensure that our spy agencies work, work within the laws and are indeed proportionate with democracies. Crispin, would you like to pick up there? Yeah, I, th- I think you, th- that's a, a very good summary of what's going on. I think the scandal's going to really take off this one that we're dealing with at the moment. If, as one of the French newspapers, I think Liberation, a case of a left-wing newspaper, suggested last week that some of the American targets in France of so-called mass surveillance were in fact businessmen, uh, not just politicians and not just unsurprisingly people connected to terrorism. I think if we discover that Boeing has been spying on Airbus, um, this is this um, EU US spat is going to take a turn for the worse. Maybe Claude, you want to pick up there. Uh, Crispin just mentioned the, the situation in France there. Yes, the situation in France is very particular because actually, uh, of course, the French media focused on the on the Snowden leaks and on the NSA story. But uh, at the very beginning of July, the daily newspaper Le Monde published a very nice story about the fact that 
the, the external intelligence in France and the internal intelligence are doing exactly the same as the NSA is, uh, is doing. Of course, not on the same scale, but uh, it's the same operation. If dropping uh, millions or at least hundreds of thousands of people in France and outside France without any control and outside any supervision. So I think it's a concern not only for the U.S., but also, of course, for, 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 the, for the French. The problem is not so to be monitored if uh, there is a security reason, a reason, of course. The problem is that a massive uh, operation uh, without precise targeting could be a threat to, to the civil liberties, of course. And we're going to try and unravel this operation uh, during the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, I just want to g bring James into the conversation here, um, who's there in Washington. And, and, and James, what do you make about this idea that President Obama didn't know about the, the current situation? Do you believe this? And, 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 and if so, how could this have been the case? Well, it's really hard for me to believe that the... Um <laughs> the policy, having written three books on NSA, the policy had always been uh, that uh, something that would potentially create an enormous flap, an enormous scandal, is always uh, uh, run by the the president uh, before it's done. Otherwise, uh, you've got an agency that's basically going rogue. In other words, uh, doing things without uh, White House approval. So it, it's hard for me to believe that uh, he wasn't, uh, uh, asked for his permission or at least advised that this was going on. And if he wasn't, then I think there's a serious problem of an agency that's acting without uh, presidential authorization on doing something as serious as eavesdropping on friendly foreign leaders. Would it seems you... highly unlikely to, to me that, sorry, it's Chris, it seems highly unlikely to me that President Obama didn't know. And indeed, we just heard him briefly at the beginning of the program, he would be the end user of any transcripts from uh, Chancellor Merkel's uh, telephone that nobody else really, except the people at the very highest level of the American government, would have any use for that sort of information. So I, I'm not convinced, however, it is a tradition for the President of the United States to have plausible deniability. We gave it to President Reagan, so perhaps we should allow President Obama off the hook as well. Can I just well, point out so um, that we have a situation where certainly in the UK, the politicians don't necessarily know exactly what the intelligence agencies are doing. So perhaps it isn't inconceivable that a President Obama didn't know the, the nitty gritty detail of what was going on. Although I do find that surprising things he's supposed to sign off on a CIA kill list every Tuesday. But in the UK, um, we have had government ministers and former government ministers come out since the Edward Snowden disclosures and say they actually did not know the sheer scale of the GCHQ tempera. Um, spying initiative. And also, of course, the oversight mechanisms within the UK make it very difficult for politicians really to know what is going on at an operational level within the intelligence agencies, because there is no meaningful oversight. And what oversight that does exist, and there is some, and it sounds good in a democracy, but what does exist can be gained by the spies and manipulated by the spies so that actually the politicians think they're being told what's going on, but often they don't know, really. Well, in, in Washington, what uh, happens a lot of times is they delegate authority, and uh, Obama has delegated a great deal of authority over the intelligence community, um, including running the drone program largely and other things like that, to uh, uh, John Brennan, who's now running the CIA. He was his uh, top, uh, pretty much his top intelligence advisor until... Mm -hmm became head of the CIA, and um, I mean, it's theoretically possible that the uh, the, the information uh, from NSA was passed on to John Brennan, and then John Brennan decided that uh, it was information overload for President Obama, and therefore didn't tell him. I mean, it's hard to say at this time, at this point, but I, I would say that it'd be an enormous uh, breach of of uh, uh, protocol for the. Um, uh, national security advisor or the top counterterrorism advisor not to advise the president that uh, we're eavesdropping on somebody that he's having regular meetings with uh, who's a friendly foreign leader. But those two have also been caught out in um, misleading Congress, haven't they? I think uh, yeah. Alexander has now had to admit that um, NSA spying only might have contributed to stopping one terrorist attack in the last year rather than 54. And James Clapper has now had to admit that he um, lied last year to Congress about whether or not the NSA was 
data mining American information. And of course, they are now. We know that because of Snowden. Exactly. I mean, the is, uh, is virtually nil with the U.S. government. Uh, in addition to what uh, you just mentioned, uh, the, there, there really are only two oversight uh, responsibilities over the NSA. One is the Congress. The other is the Foreign Intelligence <laughs> Surveillance Court. And as you mentioned, uh, mm. the NSA was caught or the uh, uh, James Clapper was caught lying to the Congress, and and on the other side, on the court side, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court has complained numerous times in secret uh, that the NSA was misleading it uh, at least three times in the past few years. So you've got a problem here of enormous uh, credibility gap when it comes to uh, the truthfulness of, of information about this program. On this side of the Atlantic, I find General Alexander a very fascinating figure. Um, I mean, seeing him giving, seeing him on TV occasionally, but also finding out, as we all have, about his headquarters when he ran the military uh, intelligence command. Is it, where is it? I think Fort, Fort Beaver, where, where he ran something called an Information Dominance Center, and it's all set up like Star Trek. Maybe that's something that <laughs> Snowden and others put in. But, but, I, but I, I, I sort of... I mean, I'm not quite poking fun, but I do get the feeling with some of these guys, and I think it's true in the UK as well, that they've slightly um, slightly lost the plot or, or the power of the intelligence establishment has gone to their heads. Well, I'd like to bring in a couple of more guests at, at this uh, point. Christopher Burgess uh, is a former CIA a officer. He, he worked with them for about 30 years. He's now the CEO of a security and intelligence company called Prevendra. Thanks for joining us, Christopher. And also Peter Warren, who is editor of Future in- Intelligence. There are quite a few of you sat around the table now. So when you do speak, if you could just remind our listeners who um, is speaking, that would be wonderful. Um, now, let me go straight to the questions that have been coming in. Um, Tang is in South Sudan and he's posted on Facebook, how can a head of state be spied on uh, whilst uh, there is an intelligence agency in that particular country who should be protecting them. Maybe, Christopher, you want to pick up, and Peter, obviously, do follow on. So uh, how, how can a leader be spied on uh, in, in the context of uh, the discussion that's been uh, ongoing? Uh, the information gets collected in the vacuum. Uh, we're dealing with uh, packet switch networks now. We're not dealing with analog networks. So those pipes are very, very fat. Some leadership uh, comms, I'm sure, are are targeted. Others are uh, collected in the collateral and are bonus. Uh, So the the counterintelligence capabilities of the country should be there to ensure that encryption is used and those calls, if you will, cannot be uh, intercepted. I remember when Obama came in with his uh, inauguration and he had his BlackBerry, it created quite a hullabaloo because it was not an encrypted device. Yeah, I mean, I, the, 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 that's obviously the, the, the issue, isn't it? That Why wasn't, uh, if Merkel's in, um, communications were picked up, but even if they were encrypted, the capacity does exist to uh, break it, the encryption of particular uh, communications if it is deemed to be worthwhile doing so. And you could quite easily say that um, Angela Merkel's communications could be very, very valuable things to know what's inside them, even if they were encrypted. I think it's interesting. Um, I would go to the next step. I agree with the the um, comment about deep packet inspection and everything. But the reason that our leaders have been vulnerable is... We may have a problem there with Annie's line. We'll try and get her back up as soon, as soon as we can. Would anyone else like to pick up on that question about how it is that leaders can be spied on? Well, this is James Bamford. Uh, the problem is that... Uh, the Germans have been cooperating with the U.S. for a very long time in terms of uh, giving access to communications uh, within Germany. I mean, that's how the U.S. has been able to intercept a lot of the information uh, within Germany, the 70 million phone calls a month, for example, or whatever. But obviously, they didn't give permission to uh, or, or access to uh, the chancellor's uh, communications. But I was just in Berlin, I uh, just re- returned yesterday, and I uh, saw the uh, embassy and I saw where they were doing the spying. It's basically a uh, uh, on the different corners of the embassy, there's a facility that's um, made out of uh, basically fiberglass, a very porous material. 
And that's where the uh, NSA uh, unit called the Special Collection Service intercepts these communications. And it's virtually right across the, uh, the uh, courtyard near the Brandenburg Gate from uh, uh, German government ministry offices. So the NSA has a tremendous capability to pull in all these communications uh, from high-level officials, including obviously the, the chancellor uh, in, in Berlin. I believe we have Annie's line back. So, Annie, please feel free to pick up where you left off. Yes, I hope you can hear me now. Um, I, I totally agree with the, the earlier comment about the packet inspection aspect. I think one, if we go back a step, one of the major fundamental mistakes that um, our West, other Western countries made outside the US was to go along with using US corporations for the basis of their communications technology, be it Blackberries, be it Microsoft technology, be it uh, Apple Mac or whatever, because as we've seen from the Snowden disclosures, these are the companies that have been targeted and potentially, allegedly, collaborated with the NSA in order to allow them to snoop on the communications over their devices. So, for example, if I were in charge of ensuring the encryption security of the Pre Prime Minister of the U UK... You're listening to World Have Your Say, and we're talking... Oh, I would I think... suggest they move on to something like open source technology and get away from that corporatist thing. I do apologise for the quality of Annie's line. We are going to try and get that sorted out um, as we speak. But let me just remind you of what we're listening to. Uh, you're listening to World Have Your Say, and we're talking about how countries go about spying on each other. No surprise that the discussion stems from the ongoing claims of US spying from Spain, France and Germany. And I'm joined by a group of spying experts who are here to take your questions on this very subject. And Ricardo's done just that. Let's move the conversation on a bit specifically to, to what's going on now with those millions of calls uh, alleged allegedly being tapped. Now, Ricardo in Jamaica has tweeted us and writes, can the NSA eavesdrop on citizens of a foreign country without the assistance of their local telephone service provider? Maybe, Claude, you'd like to come back in on that. Yes, I think there is no, no question about this. Uh, the, the NSA have the technical capacity to, to, to intercept the, the signals, even if the, the, the local uh, telephone company and the local intelligence services, of course, don't, uh, don't cooperate with them. This is not a big, a big issue for them. They, they spend billions uh, and tens of billions probably the last decade and the last 20 years to develop all those, uh, those systems. But I think that's basically uh, the point is much more it's not a technical point they have the capacity to do it and so they will do it and they will very likely continue to do it the problem is uh, I have a concern about is it useful to intercept dozens of, of millions of conversations can you really analyze them can you really use them as uh, a, a target uh, as a targetable as, as a excuse me as a usable intelligence and a practical intelligence and i don't think so i remember that at the time of uh, september 11 uh, if, if i'm right the fbi had 50 or, or 60000 hours of uh, recording of uh, telephone of uh, phone calls which were never translated and so never used i'm but sure i'm sure this is crispin uh, black and i'm sure that's right uh, i mean i haven't been in the business uh, for a few years but i just wonder how you can make sense of all these uh, you know millions of gigabytes of, of data i can understand for instance how if you're looking at, say, a flight manifest for people getting on an aeroplane, traveling from one place to another, and they're, they're setting off in a place where you can acquire drugs, say. I mean, you can actually set up a telephone pattern, a credit card pattern, all sorts of data patterns that will enable you to, for instance, identify a drugs mule. But, I mean, that's, that's targeted, sensible use uh, of intelligence, this mass trawling like one of those sort of Taiwanese trawlers that kills everything on the seabed. I just don't see how anybody has the time uh, to make sense of it. And I was interested uh, about a month ago to notice, published somewhere on the web, were, were the statistics of President Obama reading his or having a presidential daily brief. He, he plays more golf than he has presidential daily intelligence briefs. And, and, and he has far fewer than than President George W. Bush did. And I, I wonder if President Obama hasn't realized that actually reading um, a digest of 90 million telephone calls is, is just not worth his while. But, it, but it's, it's just not, it, that's not how it works, is it? I mean, it's, it's Peter Warren here from Future Intelligence. I mean, essentially, what, what, what you're after is not 
monitoring all of these these calls. This is a big data issue. We're in the information age. So what you want to do is you want to see the relationships that exist between particular individuals and the data, and you make patterns and maps out of that. You also use that big pool of data to take profiles of individuals, their data use, their financial patterns, things that you think are the actual constituents of a terrorist, and you actually set that algorithm loose through the big pool of data looking for the individuals that match <clears throat> that sort of pattern so that you can actually get into what is has been viewed as a very bad thing but it's a probabilistic mo mode where you can identify people who might be cells of terrorists where you can identify people who may be individuals that's the purpose of the exercise it isn't that all of these calls are necessarily being listened to you're actually looking for particular individuals and you're looking for particular sets of behaviour and the data can actually or can theoretically demonstrate that. And then this is, you have that, is, uh, you uh, in. I've got some thoughts on that. This is Christopher. And I agree with what Christian just said. Uh, so much of the analytic work done in counterterrorism, counterintelligence uh, is done in hindsight. And so this data sets are, are queried based on new intelligence, and then they're requeried on new intelligence that comes after that. And, and so having large-scale data sets that might uh, include calls from a, a country, let's use Spain as the example, how many uh, nefarious individuals might transit Spain and use their telecommunication system while they're doing it that none of us know about today, but in two years' time, as we're walking the cat back to find these individuals, this will be uh, a, a treasure trove of clues, perhaps. And so to say that it was targeted specifically to the 60 million calls in one month to go after to the 40 million Spanish citizens, eh, I think that's naive. But this is James Banford. Look, uh, it, it's rather uh, useless, the whole system. Uh, look, look at uh, the United States. We missed the first World Trade Center attack. We missed the attack on the USS Cole. We missed the attacks on the U.S. embassies in East Africa. We missed 9-11. We missed the underwear bomber uh, over Detroit, the Times Square bomber, and they missed the bombing that took place in in Boston, and the problem is you're building a uh, uh, a haystack, electronic haystack, uh, uh, up to the moon practically in terms of the, the amount of data you're collecting, and the amount of uh, uh, usefulness you're getting out James, of it. James, I'm going to ask you to pause there because we're just coming up to the BBC News. We will come back to you in a few minutes after the latest BBC News. This is Lise Doucette from BBC News. You're listening to World Have Your Say. Hello, I'm Krupa Pati. Thanks for staying with us. Spies will be spies. That's the response from some commentators to the NSA surveillance revelations. It's certainly not the response many angry Europeans might be looking for amid this week's wave of claims that millions of phones have been tapped in France, Spain and Germany by the US. Everybody does it. That's what some of you are saying. And so, if every, everyone does it, how do they do it? Keep sending us your questions for our panel of spying experts at facebook.com slash world have your say. Tweet us using the hashtag WHYS. Well, I'm still joined by a wealth of spying experts. Uh, they are James Bamford, author of Body of Secrets. So he tweets at uh, Wash Author. Christopher Burgess, a former CIA officer and now the CEO of a security and intelligence company called Pre Prebendra. That's near Seattle. Uh, Kristen Black is a former government intelligence analyst. Claude Moniquet, a former French intelligence officer and now co-director of European Strategic Intelligence and Security uh, Centre in Brussels. And Peter Warren is the editor of Future Intelligence. And finally, Annie Machon, who is a former British intelligence officer. Like I said, a wealth of guests there. So like I said, please do remind our audience of who is speaking. But let's go back to James, uh, who was commenting on on how you know it, it's really been possible to, to tap into this many calls. 
Well, what I've been saying is that uh, uh, what you're doing is fairly useless. You keep building uh, more and more data, uh, pulling in more and more data, and it makes it more and more difficult to find that needle. I mean, what, when uh, the uh, director of NSA, uh, Keith Alexander, um, said that they had detected 54 incidents because of this, it turned out that uh, none of that was really true. They, uh, I think they finally came down to there was one incident from much of this uh, surveillance that they had been doing that they were able to te detect. It was one person in San Diego who sent $8,000 to some group in Somalia. So what you have is an agency uh, that is largely out of control. It's uh, collecting far more information than, than is needed. And then it's lying about uh, what it's doing when it's uh, uh, before Congress or before the courts or now before the public. And I, th I actually think, I mean, I think James is absolutely right. I, I, I was talking to the head of uh, Internet Governance at Oxford um, a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying that the whole issue with big data is that there, there is this tremendous ten temptation to hold huge amounts of data. And because you're holding that huge amount of data, what you don't realise is that a lot of it actually goes out of date and that the um, patterns that you're looking for are patterns, of, they're contemporaneous patterns, and if you're holding this huge mass of data, what you're doing is using these big data techniques, but you're distorting the picture that you're getting, even if you could usefully use it, which is, you know, a, a moot point. I mean, I, I think that the real issue is that intelligence should... Everybody gets uh, caught up in the whole notion of big data and the Internet itself. They seem to think that as a result of all of this, there is this huge proliferation. There probably are not such a huge number more terrorists... Um, and so the issue becomes one of targeting. Yes, you can get more sympathizers. Yes, you can do recruiting via the Internet. But in terms of actually what you can usefully do in terms of putting together the targets for terrorists, you can't actually do that. And so the intelligence agencies are, um, in a sense, confusing themselves because they are trying to put as much data as possible to try to protect their backsides, for want of a better word, when really, you know, they should be going back to the, uh, the, 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 the primary ways of doing this, which is looking for the people that you want to find and looking for the communications that you're after. This, uh, there are two other uh, potential problems with big data as well in, um, in a de democracy. First of all, there, if you're using computer algorithms to look for patterns and identify suspicious patterns of behavior or communication, then there will, will always be a margin of error, even if it's 0.0001%. But then if you're hoovering up billions and billions and billions of bits of communication, then that 0.0001% becomes a huge number of people who are entirely innocent, who'd be entirely wrongly targeted by the intelligence agency. So that is the first problem. The second one is, of course, that all this information is stored. And so even if you're innocent today, in the future, if the laws change, the goalposts change, so for now you might be waving a placard on the street as an Occupy demonstrator or something, in the future if the laws change and you become... Occupy becomes deemed to be a terrorist organization, as it's been called in the city of London already, then suddenly they could go back and trawl through all this stored old data and you could be penalized for what you did in your youth. So I think those are two key fundamental problems that big data presents in the future. I, I agree with that completely. And in fact, it was again, it was one of the points that Professor Victor Meyer Schomburger was, was adamant about. And in fact, other, other people that I've spoken to in America, um, like oddly the person who was in charge of advising the US um, intelligence agencies on privacy. Um, and they, they were all saying that there is now a need for permissions to actually be placed upon data, not just that there, there is a need for those permissions to be placed upon data, but the government has to acknowledge this, that also there is a need for there to be a... Um, an advisory on the way that governments are going to interpret laws to allow to allow them to conduct surveillance like this, that really what you're going to have to do is be a hell of a lot more transparent. And, you know, that's not is evidently not been happening. And that is what has to happen. Crispin, you're trying to get in there. 
yeah, uh, no, today... I was just going to say, sometimes I feel, particularly in the UK, that we've, we've, we're using intelligence instead of more traditional security measures, you, you know, like Bobby's on the beat, but in, in particular, border control. I don't, don't know what things are like in America, but our borders have become more porous over the years. And as we seem to have a sort of softer outer shell, we require much more activity actually inside the country. And I wonder if the intelligence... I've never seen a single top spook, and they quite often speak publicly now, uh, say, look, why don't we have proper borders back? Then we wouldn't have to run around quite so much. And I wonder if intelligence is not being used as a substitute for more traditional uh, ways of securing your country. Christopher, were you trying to come in there? I, I, I was, and uh, on the point prior, uh, I, I think the the root of the problem uh, is, uh, as Mr. Bamford uh, pointed out, is the SSCI, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence didn't do their job. Uh, they they should have been uh, much deeper in their oversight as the uh, different intelligence agencies built their capabilities. And I, I'm an advocate of having the strongest whiz-bang, oh-my-God type capabilities available to me as, a, as an intelligence officer for when I need them. But I also uh, operated for 30 years under the uh, make sure you understand what you're going to say to Congressman Jones when you make your decision on using it and the understanding that as an intelligence officer, I worked for a support organization. I was supporting the policy directives of another organization. And so today, uh, the SSCI is uh, hearing uh, the former leaders of the intelligence, uh, General Alexander's there, I understand, and Senator Feinstein's uh, the leader of that committee. She's expressing her outrage. But I think the outrage should be, were you asleep at the wheel in your oversight cap cap capabilities? And what new checks and balances are you going to be put in place so that when information is collected that goes outside of the purview of the mission at hand, how is it retained or how is it redacted or how is it destroyed? And I do take Crispin's comment that, you know, that openness there will go a long way towards reassuring uh, the other nations in the world that the U.S. has both the U.S. interests at heart, but also theirs. So it's almost a question of who is monitoring the intelligence officials. Absolutely. Well, that, and that, that's the role of the oversight committees. Who guards the guardians? It's the old question. Yeah, yeah I mean, and that's the problem that we've seen here in the, in the U.S. is the fact that the uh, um, that's how these intelligence committees started out in, in the mid-'70s was as sort of watchdogs uh, protecting the public and so forth uh, from the uh, intelligence agencies. But more recently, they be become mostly uh, uh, cheering galleries for the intelligence agencies uh where were they when the uh when the nsa was doing all this warrantless wiretapping for two and a half years they didn't even know about it they weren't even asking questions about it instead what they were arguing for is more uh more money and more authorities for the intelligence agencies so the oversight and the protective uh, aspects of the uh congressional intelligence committees are um just completely diminished and on the court side uh, after the warrantless eavesdropping uh, issues came up, uh, there was a, um, a decision in Congress to weaken uh, the oversight of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. They created a Foreign Intelligence Surveillance, um, a, a new amendment to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that weakened the court. So you have uh, a fairly ineffective uh, uh, Senate and House Intelligence Committee, and you have a very weakened uh, court system. And at the same time, you've got uh, General Alexander, the head of NSA. I just did a cover story for Wired Magazine in July on this. Uh, he's now the most uh, powerful intelligence official in the history of the United States. He's been there for almost nine years. He's a four-star general. And he's not only in charge of the largest intelligence agency in the world, the NSA, He's now also in charge of uh, the uh, U.S. Cyber Command, which has launched a cyber war against uh, Iran a few years ago, the Stuxnet, uh, Stuxnet uh, virus, for example. So you've got enormous power concentrated in one person in charge of uh, all this eavesdropping, cyber war, and everything else, and a very weakened Congress and a very weakened uh, um, uh, court system that does the oversight. 
I must admit, I'm future just... intelligence. I mean, that, that is, is, it is really the crucial issue. Uh, the Snowden's revelations about the black budget, he revealed, what, the 600 billion spending since um, 2000, um, which, you know, is, is nearly sort of um, uh, 50 billion a year. But th those were figures that the US in, um, uh, oversight committees had been asking for for a long time. I mean, somebody said to me about this that you, there, there could be the paradoxical. Uh, uh, situation of Snowden being given a U.S. Congressional Medal of Honor for this at the same time as he's sent to prison. Um, the, 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 he'd, he'd actually performed a great function, but that was a function that the, the intelligence agencies should have actually been performing. Here in the U.K., we've seen what, what looks like a very, very supine intelli intelligence monitoring or surveillance um, by uh, Sir Malcolm Rifkin, who you know, obviously had no idea at all about what was going on. Now, the, the, the situation is quite evidently that the, the, the only way to solve this is to beef up the powers, to give the, the, um, these monitoring committees equivalent powers to the courts to actually demand and subpoena documents and to find out exactly what's going on. Yet, when the, the, those people who are on the US monitoring committees were apparently given oversight, they were uh, uh, allowed to go to rooms and they weren't allowed to take notes, they weren't allowed to do anything. I mean, the, 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 that's, that's quite amazing that, that you're meant to be monitoring a situation and yet if somebody tells you exactly what you can do in terms of monitoring them. You're listening to World Have Your Say, where we're talking about the ongoing uh, strained relations between America and its European allies over the large-scale intelligence gathering operations. Now, on this edition of World Have Your Say, we're asking how spying is actually carried out, and we want your questions for our panel of surveillance experts. It's facebook.com slash worldhaveyoursay, or you can tweet me directly at Krupa Party. Now, Saroj has done just that. She's posted from India and says, um, what information do the intelligence agencies get by spying on the head of states of countries like Brazil Germany and France, do they think these heads of states involve, are involved in terrorism? Um, Annie, maybe you want to pick up on that. Well, of course they don't. Um, what they want, if they're trying to get any general information, is just intelligence, an intelligence picture, the connections, the uh, diplomatic relationships, the plans of the um, leaders of different countries. I mean, that's all it is, because that enables the NSA to gain leverage in whatever negotiations are going on, be it diplomatic or trade or whatever. Um, and that's, that's the aim of the game, really. So it has nothing whatsoever to do with terrorism. It has everything to do with knowledge is power, the old adage. And it is um, illegal under most definitions of what can and cannot be surveyed. Yes, but why would you spy on your allies, essentially? Uh, well, you still want to know what they're getting up to, be it politically or economically, because when you go into negotiations, that gives you the advantage if you already know what they're holding in their hands. So, of course, the US is going to want to know that sort of information because they're trying to push through all sorts of international trade agreements, be it across the Pacific or across the Atlantic, things like ACTA, the anti-copyright trade agreement as well that was stopped last year, um, you know, various other things that they keep trying to impose by lobbying hard on the European Parliament to impose across Europe, Europe for example. And they have to go to the negotiating table with these leaders, and if they know what the leaders have already planned, what they're thinking, what their weaknesses, what their strengths are, then it gives them a very good negotiating position. So, of course, they're going to try and do it if they can. And because we have this new mass technology, it makes it very much easier for the NSA to do it. I think it's like playing cards. I mean, if you can see what what cards are in the other guy's hand, like Goldfinger did at the start of that Bond film, you, you tend to win. Uh, although my worry would be that perhaps the US and other diplomatic services and politicians have got so reliant on uh, using marked cards that, that, that I wonder if they haven't lost their negotiating skills or if they've uh, atrophied on the way. Or it might be, I think it's uh, looking at the cards of, uh, of a conversation that doesn't include you i.e. Sure. country yeah. X negotiating with country Y, where the discussion point is detrimental to the interests of the uh, U.S., U.K., you name it. Countries uh, have intelligence services to protect their interests. Most countries have them. Uh, the fact that the U.S. is airing its laundry out in public today uh, is uh, it's embarrassing. Well, one of the other factors is that uh, I think this came out with the... Uh, 
the arrest of uh, of uh, uh, the woman who worked for GCHQ. Uh, uh, her last name was Gunn, and uh, what it showed was that she became a whistleblower because it it uh, became obvious to her after reading these uh, messages that were coming uh, from NSA uh, that the NSA was trying to manipulate the vote in um, in uh, uh, the United Nations over whether to go to war in Iraq. So a lot of this has far more to do with uh, uh, not just uh, wondering what uh, a, a leader of a country is uh, going to have for dinner tomorrow night. A lot of it has to do with trying to find out ways to mani manipulate the uh, the leader or the country um, in areas like the uh, United Nations uh, on dis very important decisions like uh, whether to go to go to war or not. So I think those are some of the issues that that are really uh, that should really frighten some countries is the fact that yeah. the United States is not only monitoring their communications but they're monitoring monitoring them with the uh, intent of trying to manipulate the the government into doing what the United States wants it to do. Well, I mentioned that yeah, NSA right. hearing earlier at the uh, start of the programme. That has now got underway. I'm just looking at it here in the screen. And we will, of course, keep across it and bring you any top lines. Uh, I can see uh, James Clapper, uh, Director of Intelligence, there uh, testifying. Uh, and like I said, any top lines, we will bring them to you on the BBC World Service. And it's currently live on BBC World. Now, let's uh, uh, reflect a bit on this conversation. And maybe, Claude, you want to pick up on this. Claude, what's, what's the best kind of intelligence gathering? I mean, are we talking old-fashioned agents or... Or, or is where we are the best place we can be? I think that is not really a best way, but uh, I, I'm, uh, I spent my career in old-fashioned intelligence, you mind, human intelligence on the field. So I think targeted intelligence uh, by technical means or by human uh, means is clearly for me the best way to do it. But I, I will uh, also react to some things who, which were, who, who were uh, excuse me, uh, uh, some things which were uh, uh, told uh, just uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, I agree on the fact that a country, has, at the end of the day, has no ally and no friend and just interest. And the role of the intelligence service is to protect and to defend those interests. So I understand also the need to to restrain uh, the, some activities. For instance, it's wrong to spy your own people. The U.S. are not the East German with the Stasi 25 years ago. So this must be controlled. But I don't know how we can control the activities of the, of the intelligence outside our countries. When we are going outside, when we are spying, obviously we are outside the law. And I don't see... Uh, of course, you can you can put some limitation, but if you put some limitation, your friends and and your competitors and of course your enemies will won't do it. So you will be in you will be weaker. Does anyone want to pick up on that? Can I, I can I just come in here? I mean, there is some very very interesting point everybody does seem to be missing, which is that the intelligence agencies, and particularly the U.S. intelligence agencies and the U.K. GCHQ, are taking a bit of a hammering here. However, the a lot of this information that is being used is information from Google, Facebook, um, li LinkedIn. You know, uh, there there is there are a lot of other organisations that are also monitoring and surveilling um, individuals, and they're actually getting quite off quite lightly on all of this you know I mean Google's capability to actually monitor the behaviour of people is greater than that of many in, in, intelligence agencies and, and I, we, we do seem to be sort of missing the fact that these organisations the reason that they achieve such huge market capitalizations is because they're actually surveilling our, our information and extracting value from it too there was a piece today that the United Parcel Service knows more about you than probably your grandmother. Yes. <laughs> I think the key point is, why do we have intelligence agencies? We have intelligence agencies to protect our national interests in each country, our national security, the, you know, against existential threats. And perhaps we should say, well, actually, is terrorism, even in its grossest form, an existential threat to our national integrity? And I'm not sure it is. Even when the IRA was um, bombing the infrastructure and military sites across the UK, you know, for three decades, that was not an existential threat. So to, to then sweep in and do mass Big Brother-type surveillance to try and counter this, 
I think is disproportionate, shall we say. And the other aspect, of course, is that we need them to define what national security is, because certainly in the UK we've never legally done that. It's not there in legal definition. So it's very easy for it to morph into threats here, there and everywhere, and suddenly everyone becomes a potential target. So I think it's always worth taking a step back and just saying, what are the threats? How can we best protect ourselves? And what are the purposes of our intelligence agencies, rather than just giving them work because they're there? Robin Van Cooper has treated us. I actually us, think that uh... Annie's, Annie's completely right there, but but not j just because of that. Because yeah, we, we've been told that cyber security is the greatest threat to our national interests, and yet we have this disproportionate response to terrorism. And in fact, this this surveillance exercise has been justified on the basis of terrorism. Robin Vancouver has uh, tweeted us, the NSA has probably done more uh, to ruin the image of the US than any terrorist organisation could ever hope to. To all of you here, and in the final few minutes of the programme, what is the, the ongoing damage? Uh, uh, having written quite a bit about the NSA, it's an enormous amount of damage because um, it shows the hypocrisy of the United States where we're talking about... Uh, extending democracy around the world, giving people uh, uh, civil rights, human rights, and so forth. And at the same time, we're doing everything we can to spy on um, uh, not just uh, not just look for terrorists, but basically spy on everybody in a country, including their their leaders. And again, the point is that it doesn't really help in the end. It doesn't seem preventing any of these uh, uh, these uh, terrorist incidents. And what it's doing is harming the United States uh, instead of that. I think that there's also a very real reputational dam da damage that, that, that you can see in economic terms. The amount of loss that, that, that the um, US cloud computer industry has sustained as a result of this is huge. Um, it, it's running into billions now. Lots and lots of companies don't want to go anywhere near the US because they think that their data won't be safe. I would suggest there's a breakdown of trust, democratic trust, between the governed and the government. And I think that is very corrosive for our very way of life. I'm I agree sure with that. Annie. I think that uh, the corrosive nature of the discussion uh, is detrimental to everyone. Uh, furthermore, I think the uh, removing the veneer that there were adequate oversights uh, has given the United States a great opportunity to put oversight in place. The fact that the capabilities have been aired, unfortunately, I think has damaged the uh, long-term security of a number of countries that relied on those capabilities to collect information, albeit in a manner in which lacked oversight. In a way, I'm envious of the United States. I think their government model, their constitution, because of their very wise founding fathers, will allow proper oversight of their intelligence services to return or to start, depending how you look at it. Unfortunately, here in the UK, we've got nothing like that. Uh, and it is a, a great worry if you've got a rubber stamp parliament and rubber stamp committees. I don't know who is ever going to guard the guardians. And Claude? Yes, I don't think the damage is so much. Uh, of course, the, the, there is a, an immediate damage to the relation between the U.S. intelligence and the intelligence services of other countries, uh, allied countries. There is a, a, a damage to the relations between the U.S. And, uh, and some capitals. There is a damage for the image of the U.S. Uh, intelligence co uh, community. But it's not the first time in history. We had Echelon uh, 15 years ago. We had the Church Commission uh, 35 years ago about the assassination. Uh, performed by the CIA in, the, in uh, South America, for instance, uh, and uh, the intelligence survived to all those scandals. I think that at the end of the day, it, in a few months, it will be over, and I hope that the, the damage will not be so important for the security, of course, of the U.S. and of its allies, but I hope also that they will remember the first rule, don't be gawked. Thank you to all of our guests, uh, James Bamford, Crispin Black, Annie Machon, Claude Monique, uh, Christopher Burgess and Peter Warren. A fascinating discussion. And if you do want to carry on talking about this, do go to our Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash world, have your say. Thank you for listening and do join in uh, to Outside Source. That's the latest news programme on the BBC. It's presented by World Have Your Say's Ros Atkins. And uh, that's tomorrow at 10 o'clock GMT. And if you want to follow the latest on the NSA hearing, go to uh, BBC World. We're back with you tomorrow. Tomorrow evening.